So Shukla, this is your birthday present. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's a short uh, session. There are so many of us here that uh, the talks are short, and so I'm going to keep the introduction very brief. But I presume that uh, uh, there will be people will want to have some discussion, and we should especially allow uh, Shukla to comment. So I'm going to ask speakers to finish uh, three three minutes ahead of time, if, if that's okay with uh, with you, Jim. And uh, I will I will stand uh, give you a two minute warning on that. So, but when I stand up, then you'll have two minutes to finish, and that'll leave us a little time for discussion. So, our first speaker is Sir Brian Hoskins. Uh, University of Reading and Imperial College, and uh, he is going to be talking about predictability in the tropics uh, from equatorial waves. Well, I'm extremely pleased to be here and speak in this symposium in your honor, Shukla. Great pleasure. Uh, over the years, we've often discussed that the atmosphere really is probably a bit more predictable than, than all these chaos ideas would suggest. And one of the uh, reasons for thinking that is there are phenomena that occur and they, they undergo either persistence or else um, evolve in a, a fairly predictable way. And in middle latitudes, then we have our baroclinic waves and our blocking and Rossby waves and various things we can think about. And some years ago, I thought, well, what is the equivalent in the tropics? What can we hang on to? And after a little dabbling with the MJO, which was far too difficult, we went to equatorial waves and uh, trying to look at those and try and understand their behavior and see how models are handling them. So this is work with Yang Guiying over many years and also Julia Slinger when she was at Reading. And uh, I'm still sure she's still in, at heart involved now. So uh, that's what I'm going to be dealing with, equatorial waves. And I'll just go back to the simple theory for the moment that if you deal with a resting atmosphere, then the problem becomes separable in the vertical uh, and the horizontal and temporal domains. And um, assuming you've got some well, with some lid on, you have vertical modes. And then with the horizontal, you come out with this dispersion diagram for equatorial waves. And we have the um, zonal wave number along the axis here, and uh, then frequency up here. And we have Kelvin waves moving rapidly to the east. And um, in particular, in these spatial and time scales I'm going to be thinking about, I'm going to be thinking about really more synoptic time scales and perhaps predictability that might go through to, to weeks. Um, so wave numbers may be 2 to 10, and time scales may be 2 to 2 or 3 to 30 days. So we have the Kelvin wave going rapidly east, and we have Rossby waves and the westward moving mixed Rossby gravity go, wave going to the west. So that seems all very fine. The trouble is, um, if you look at the basic flow, say in the winter, the climatolog climatological flow on the equator, then we see winds with shears in the vertical and, and plus or minus maybe 10 to 15 meters per second. There's no way it's a resting atmosphere. Um, the speed, the free speeds of the waves are, would be such that they would have a critical line in the flow they just can't exist, as a simple theory suggests. And one approach is to fit various vertical uh, modes to this and then come up with a different equivalent depths. But what we've done is actually to, to do something different. And in particular, if you look at the upper troposphere, you look at the westerlies in winter um, in the East Pacific and the Atlantic, those are more than 10, 15 meters per second. And then also in the Eastern Hemisphere, we have more than 10 meters per second there. I mean, if those really, if the waves exist in those regions, we can expect some change in the dispersion diagram. So with easterly flow, the waves will go to much higher frequency. And with westerly flow, you could even get certainly the higher wave numbers moving the wrong direction with the uh, mixed Rossby gravity waves and Rossby waves at the higher wave numbers moving towards the east rather than towards the west. So we will see that that actually 
does tend to occur. So the approach we've taken over many years, um, I think we've done that. I'm not sure we've actually persuaded anyone else to do this. So uh, maybe that's a sign it's fantastic or it's hopeless, I don't know. So uh, we've used era data of various shades from era 15 through to era interim. We've divided the the motions into eastward and westward and looked at these sort of synoptic time scales and uh, spatial scales. And the way the theory goes, and that's what we're going to use, we're going to project onto the horizontal structures. And if you're going to do that, you've got to take some u plus some uh, g potential over c and r u minus that and v is what you're going to to uh, project onto so that needs a, a speed what is normally thought of as a speed c but we get that out from a trapping equatorial trapping scale so we fit the data and say what's the best trapping scale and that will give us the c to use it's nothing to do with the wave speed so we project the the data in q r and v separately at each height onto the meridian or structure of equatorial waves. And um, these parabolic cylinder functions, which is what is used, those are the structures. They're a complete set, so mathematically we can do this. There's no problem in terms of the mathematics, it can be done. <laughs> I'll talk through it for a, for a while, okay. Um, so the projection then onto those, fine, we can do it, but the question, does it make any sense? We won't assume these, the, the vertical structure or anything other than projecting onto these waves. So we won't as, uh, take the frequency, the dispersion relation. So we won't take any of that. We'll just project onto these. But what we will do is identify with the names. We'll call the n equals minus 1 bit the Kelvin wave. We'll use that as an easy name. And the next bit we'll call the mixed Rossby gravity wave. And then... Uh, the next bit, because there's no gravity waves in our box, so it's essentially the Rossby wave. So we'll use that terminology. But So what comes out of this, and this is papers over many years, is so if we look at the Kelvin wave component and we say, well, let's take the brightness temperature as an estimate of, of the convection on the, equa uh, on the equatorial region, and then we, we do a, a regression of everything against that and get a composite structure. And the heavy contour shows then a regression of the brightness temperature against that. So it gives you an idea of what goes with equatorial convection. And then if we look at the low level bit that we get from a Kelvin wave, then it's actually the, with the westerly winds in phase with, the, uh, with the, what we assume will be convection. And then if we look in the upper troposphere, we're seeing that there is a, a tilted structure with the divergence almost in that region. Now, one of the, the sort of tie-up with predictability, if we do a, a, a lag um, correlation with this, so it is longitude, and this is the lower level, and this is minus eight days back here and plus 10 days up there, you can see the, the contours of the, of the U field in this Kelvin wave, and the colors are the um, outgoing long, well, the brightness temperature uh, indicating the convection. So you can see that this structure hangs together at low levels for of the order of 10 days. You know, very nice orderly structure. At upper levels, it hangs together less, slightly less than that. And if one, um, uh, as I will in a moment, I thought I was going to there, it's, it's obviously hiding it. Okay, so what you were meant to see, and this is the first glitch, I should have gone through it. Um, so on this machine, you were not seeing the next slide, which actually shows that what the, if you just take this brightness temperature and take the full wind field in this eastward moving component, you see roughly the same Kelvin wave structure at low levels, although shifted slightly north of the equator. But in the upper troposphere, you see there's more an explosion of the air and it's uh, going out was in all directions, um, triggering a lot of gravity wave as well as the, the Kelvin wave. I hope that's not going to happen to many others, so we'll see what happens here. Now, if you um, look at the structures you get with these Rossby waves, this is for a summertime, northern hemisphere summertime. Then in the eastern hemisphere, you do actually dropping out of this get what we might call a first baroclinic wave structure, although it's actually stronger in the lower troposphere than the upper troposphere. But you don't get that everywhere. Um, and in particular, 
if you look in the Western Hemisphere, either in autumn, spring, or winter, then you see very much a bar what we might call an equivalent barotropic structure dropping out of this with maximum amplitudes in the upper troposphere. Probably indicative, as we'll see, of the that many people have talked about as the uh, interaction with higher latitudes. So now if we take those same waves and do these same lag correlation diagrams, then you can see this low-level Rossby wave being in phase with the convection or keeping its phase with the convection over a period of actually two weeks, very rock-solid structure. In the upper troposphere, again, slightly less so. But then if we look in the, the western hemisphere, in particular where the amplitude is large, again, in the upper troposphere, we see a structure hanging together for the order of two weeks. So there's really very solid structures there coming through. If we look in the Eastern Hemisphere at what the full um, horizontal structure looks like for these uh, westward moving waves, I'm going to be very careful moving this because you get onto the next slide and you're not careful. So what we see is developing first a Rossby wave at low levels in the lower troposphere. And the convection then is in that northward flowing, wave, uh, northward flowing air and in the, in the cyclonic part of the wave. And so that's the region of convection. And this structure is set up at lower levels earlier. And then when the convection really gets going by day zero, we then see again this explosion of the air from the upper troposphere. So it doesn't look like a Rossby wave anymore, but it very much looks like a mixed Rossby gravity wave. So we see the coupling of those structures. And again, you can see a, a very much um, uh, a predictable evolution in those structures. Uh, in another talk, I very much relate those to the, the Hadley cell, um, the, the synoptic contribution to the Hadley cell. Now, moving onwards, and perhaps I've even accelerated more than I expect, so to think about the, um, the structures a little bit more, and I'm now going to refer to winter, which here is November to April. Um, and again, the, the top panel over here shows you the, the flow and um, I've talked a little bit about the Eastern Hemisphere, but now it's going to be the Western Hemisphere I'll concentrate, and in particular the westerlies then that in the East Pacific and also in the Atlantic. But if we look at the structures, the climatological activity of the Kelvin wave as identified by these projections, we see it mainly in the upper troposphere, but in the Eastern Hemisphere. But then the other waves are uh, mainly the maxima are definitely in the winter hemisphere, in the western hemisphere where the westerlies are. And we do get um, the westward moving Rossby gravity wave and also the eastward moving part of that. So again, as expected, it's the shorter waves that tend to move um, eastward um, and the um, the longer waves that tend to move towards the west, but we get maxima in both those in the westerly regions. And the Rossby wave is less obvious, although the, the eastward moving part of that again clearly maxima in the two westerly regions. So that's what I'm just going to uh, do in the last part of this talk then, is look at what determines those, ma those wave behaviors there and the maxima in the, the western hemisphere. And to do that, I'm going to use the ENSO, because really those westerlies change a lot between one phase of ENSO and another. So the, in the, um, the El Nino, then, the, um, we have the maximum westerlies then going to be in the, uh, in the Atlantic. That's when the westerlies maximum there. But in the La Nina is when there'll be a maximum in the East Pacific. So looking at... Um, the eastward moving mixed Rossby gravity wave with a westerly moving mixed Rossby gravity wave structure, then let's just look at the pictures to start with. And this is in this level here is in the Pacific, East Pacific. And we see in both cases the El Nino and on the right the La Nina, we see subtropical waves or waves coming in from middle latitudes. It's very clear in the La Nina the penetration in the maximum westerly time into the Pacific is much greater. And you can see the, the triggering of the uh, mixed Rossby gravity wave. This is an eastward moving structure triggered from the higher latitudes. 
And if you look at the picture above then, although the wave activity is higher in the subtropics in the El Nino, it's the La Nino when the, the uh, waves come into the equator. And the opposite is true in the Atlantic, going again with the westerly phase. So the, the picture then that one gets, if one looks at the full wave fill as of wave activity in the subtropics, giving you the Rossby wave and the wave field in the um, subtropics and the higher latitudes diving into the equatorial region to give you the mixed Rossby gravity wave and again southern hemisphere waves as well. But we can have these structures also for the westward moving and this is longer wavelength as we suggested from simple Doppler shifting ideas and again you see westward uh, moving waves in the higher latitudes triggering the, the um, either Rossby-like Rossby looking waves or the mixed Rossby gravity wave in the equatorial region. And in particular, the southern hemisphere, very important in these patterns moving towards the west in triggering those waves. So what I've tried to show you is, I think it's very useful to use these structures and not impose anything else about equatorial waves to diagnose observations and models. I haven't shown that. But these equatorial waves do show a very coherent behavior over time scales up to two weeks, and that I hope offers the, the hope of predictive skill. What we need to do in models is actually capture the interaction of dynamics and the physical parameterizations, and also the interaction with higher latitudes. We looked at models a few years ago, and they were failing in many aspects of this, and we need to do that again. Thank you. You asked me to ask a question, so you managed to give double lecture by using two texts and just once. Uh, so how much of this persistence and this sort of 10, 15 days is because of the interaction with the context? I think it's very important yeah. that we can actually capture that yeah. in our models and the predictability. How critical it is. Um, I think it, it varies for those waves I showed in the eastern hemisphere in the northern hemisphere summer, absolutely crucial. Although the, it, the um, organization seemed to be very much by the low-level Rossby wave, but then the convection became order one importance in giving the whole vertical structure. I think if you're dealing with the Western Hemisphere in winter or the transition seasons, we're looking at a dynamical response to the higher latitudes, and we are seeing structures that then have a lot of convection with them, but I think they're determined more dynamically. So it gives you one, two, Two things. One is, can you actually get the convection that's with the dynamics, but not changing the structure too much? But then, when it's order one importance, can you get it as well? I had a. Oh, yes. Yes. Can I have one second? Yes. Do you have a question? Yes, I have. Try it. Try it. Is it possible to project these structures, uh, say, to forecast these structures statistically just by moving the the phases and sort of create a synoptic map? Yeah, I mean, that, it would be, a, I was thinking, it's useful to give these sorts of talks because you actually say, well, how much skill would they really give us if we just impose the structure? And I think that's an interesting question and I don't know the answer. I mean, I think we, if we look at raw maps, we see the structures. And so I think there is skill there to be had just from such an extrapolation. Uh, but I don't think be order one. Julia, I'm not sure you're allowed to ask a question, seeing I put you on the title page, but okay. I, I was just going to say we continue to use these uh, as a fundamental test, and we're monitoring these and we're using them to predict Good. 
Good, 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 good. Right, don't go away. So, uh, so I, I only make this speech once, and, and you're our guinea pig. So um, <laughs> we're, we're going to thank all of our speakers over the course of the symposium with a little gift. Uh, and the gift is an umbrella. That's like giving it's, an Englishman an umbrella. It's a, but it's a, it's a very special umbrella. It's a George Mason University umbrella with green and gold. So Ooh, you will be very wow. conspicuous when you use this umbrella. That's the Australian's so. cricket colors. <laughs> so thank, thank you very much. Thank you.